Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the Weaviate podcast. I'm super excited to welcome Leo Boystov. Leo is currently a senior research scientist at AWS Labs. Uh, prior to this, he's written a dissertation at Carnegie Mellon University titled Efficient and Accurate Non-Metric k and Search with Applications of Text Matching. I started studying Leo's work after seeing some of his tweets that uh, brought a ton of knowledge to the discussion around deep learning for search technology. And finally, Leo's co-authored an incredible new work in pairs light that I'm just super, super excited to dive into. Uh, so firstly, Leo, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's great to be here. Awesome. So could we, I think maybe setting the stage, I, re I really want to start with this in pairs light work. I think this is so interesting. And maybe this background of, as we think about the intersection of large language models and search technology, I think most of us are sort of going in this direction of you sort of retrieve and read, you use the search results to uh, to put into the context of the language model to ground its generation. But this other idea of using the language model to generate training data for the, you know, for the search models, I think is so interesting. So could you maybe start by describing your interest in this? Um, yeah, um, if you don't mind a little bit of, um, I would like to start with a little bit like historic uh, background uh, with, with uh, retrieval, maybe uh, I should say a couple of words uh, about retrieval in general, and also about um, the difficulty of applying uh, machine learning to retrieval. And that has been like historically so uh, the case. Uh, it what we usually what what we did before all the machine learning we had we indexed uh, text using uh, inverted files which basically is your you know book uh, book catalog for every keyword you you will get like pages where this this word occurs and uh the the biggest advance was the basically the bm25 function that would um tell you uh, the score of of a page, uh, given how many times the, the certain keywords appear in in a page, and that was a step, big step forward compared to the previous scoring function, compared to Boolean search, where you would have to specify all the words that need to appear, and uh, that would experts would do. So, and, and that uh, BM25 function was really a big standard for quite a while, and it was difficult to beat, even with machine learning techniques. Because what happened next, like people figured out that BM25 is a good, um, good signal, but there can be other ones, and then they um, started to use machine learning uh, approaches such as boosted regression trees to combine those. And that's the so-called learning to rank. Um, and that, um, and, and, and somewhat regretfully in many cases, it actually did, didn't help much. And all like the, uh, whereas NLP was advancing at, you know, at, at, at you know, rather rapid pace in, in in information retrieval, it was for a long time, it was not possible to beat beyond 25 or like slight, um, you know, slightly boosted BM25. And and one reason, and, and there is actually a real reason for this, in my opinion, is that in NLP, uh, like say, consider something like a classification task. In NLP, you look at a page and there are like certain attributes of that page that are indicative, for example, of the sentiment, right? And they're only uh, typically or often they are only attributes that are specific to that page. But when you're doing retrieval, you need to look at, uh, at features that, um, that are query document features, the pairwise features. And those features need to be sufficiently generic. So the, the, it's, it's often just not enough to look at, oh, oh this is like a trigram or bigram that, that appears in a document or in a query. It's often not enough. Unlike NLP, so in, in in general, this like query document um, similarity that has been historically more difficult for machine learning approaches, and uh, another thing is I, I guess that search is also much less precise and much much noisier, so it's harder to come up with this. You know, there is bigger long tail, so it's harder to uh, come up with with some some features that work for this in, in general. And again, that this is really uh, different from a lot of NLP tasks, uh, say like uh, question answering, factoid question answering. There are cues, uh, even before neural network, uh, these uh, systems were 
able to achieve a human level performance. Like for example, with IBM Watson system that uh, did human champion. Yeah, um, I hope that's not uh, not uh, not a very long introduction. But historically, uh, it was difficult. Uh, to beat simple baselines, and when uh, deep learning started to, you know, um, to become very, very popular in um, information retrieval, it's fair to say that until we got BERT, we didn't get any really good improvement, at least not in all the domains, um, over BM25. And only with BERT, which is relatively recent uh, development, we were able to beat um BM25, like, decisively. Yeah, super interesting. I think with my path in deep learning, I also remember, like, when I started deep learning, the natural language processing was mostly, like, uh, one-dimensional convolutional models, like, like, before the transformers. The transformers just, like, busted open the, <laughs> like, the yeah. deep learning for natural language processing. So so could we continue on the cross-encoders and the learning to rank? Um just kind of maybe also just the, the beginning of it being that the cross encoders are high capacity classifiers that take as input the query in the document and then output a score. And so we use that score to re-rank it. And, you know, the vector search will give us like a thousand or, you know, however many results to begin with. And then we'll re-rank that to get a higher quality list. Uh, so can you sort of describe like cross encoders and then I know learning to rank and like the... Um, usually you have like clicks to like user data, like XGBoost models. So it's like a little different, right? The thinking between cross encoders and like most of the XGBoost style learning to rank stuff that's been developed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, um, so when we say learning to rank, um, although learning to rank is a very generic, uh, very generic uh, term, but oftentimes when people say learning to rank, they mean uh, specifically that old style learning to rank when you have features. It can be pairwise features like uh, the BM25 scores. It can also be um, query specific or document specific features such as like query type or like document quality score. but these are features. So in the end, you get a long vector of features, and then you use something like boosted regression trees, or it can be actually as simple as uh, a linear function, but that's crucially on like on top of features uh, that are pre-computed somehow engineered. And with the um, with the invention of this um, strong neural uh, network models uh, such as transformer based cross encoders and bi encoders. Uh, we were able to replace uh, most of those, at least um, most of those features, with just this uh, similarity score that comes from the neural model. And it's also learning to rank, of course, but it's um, somewhat di dif different from the, the classic learning to rank. So the difference is, um, you would you say the BM25 score, maybe also like BM25 F score as well as BM25 score for the multiple properties of some kind of object, as well as the vector distance score, and you use those additional features in the re-ranking model compared to maybe these like content only neural models that just is like query document, more fine grained kind of matching. Is that like kind of an accurate description of the sort of distinction of it? Uh, yeah, I think it's a good one. And it's still possible to plug in BERT score into the bigger model too. But my uh, impression that they say for for the, the, the say query document similarity only, people would use more sophisticated feature-based model to mm -hmm. achieve BERT-like performance. But now you can replace uh, those with BERT. Uh, and in fact, in terms of the query document similarity, what I also used in the past, and that's relatively unknown um, similarity function, is the so-called um, model one. Uh, and it is semantic uh, in terms of, uh, in the sense that it can uh, assign scores between query document pairs that are not exact match. And in some certain cases, in particular for question answering uh, for uh, if you retrieve document for a question answering system, it gives really big boost on top of BIM25, which actually few people know, but this is the case. And um, it, 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 it can improve BIM25 upon BIM25, but you would still need to do some fusion, like simple learning to rank. Uh, and you can replace it now using BERT and typically get much better results. 
so I guess kind of the ending on uh, replacing it with Bird is sort of where I where I'm hoping this is headed is that these cross encoders can just sort of again like the query document is input and kind of overcome needing to do all this feature engineering in the learning to rank that maybe just the cross encoders can re rank by themselves just based on the based on a more fine grained query document representation and and maybe we could. Um, Maybe we could come back to the in pairs light and how you how you train cross encoders for custom domains. Maybe talk about the zero shot versus the in domain cross encoder in sort of that sort of direction. So uh, yeah, uh, um, sure. So the uh, as I said, it can uh, the, the 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 cross encoder can largely replace uh, some pre neural machinery that was using the combination of features. And for the cross encoder, a cross encoder. And there are two types of neural models that we're using now, but they are both transformer-based. But basically, cross-encoder is a little bit more accurate, and it um, you concatenate the queries and documents and pass it through the uh, multi-layer, a, a relatively large transformer model, which uh, basically produces you a score uh, using a projection layer. Uh, uh, additional projection layer, and you train this model. So these models are pretty accurate. Um, there is also a bi-encoder model uh, where you encode queries and documents separately and produce uh, embeddings, which you can compare using cosine similarity. Those models are somewhat less accurate, uh, but they permit a faster retrieval because you can uh, co pre-compute embeddings during the index time. So these are two types of models. And in terms of the... Um, so those, those are great, but there is one problem. So typically, uh, well, that's... A perennial probably when you're training data for these models. These models are relatively, especially cross encoders, they're relatively data efficient, but not like it's not like you can train them on five examples. We have a paper where we uh, evaluated the few short properties for a number of collections, and yeah, it's more like um, hundreds. Uh, well, if these are sparsely charged queries, you need a few thousand, maybe hundreds with. Um, densely judged queries with a lot of relevance judgments per, per query, then um, you can do fewer of them. It's still a lot of data, right? And another problem is that um, they are trained for a specific type of document, which you call domain. For example, question answering over Wikipedia, and you try to transfer it to another domain, say legal documents, and oftentimes it just doesn't work. So and we, uh, it's not like a big discovery that that was expected. We uh, we showed that that was the case. Uh, in in fact, concurrently with that uh, uh, now famous beer paper, <laughs> uh, then uh, they did it also for, they um, they did of course much more because they showed it also for bi-encoders. And what they mm -hmm. showed that in fact, cross encoders transfer better than, uh, than, than bi-encoders. Um, and uh, I perhaps should clarify what we mean uh, by transferring better or worse. So in domain mismatch, and big problem with domain mismatch is that uh, it's not just performance goes down, it goes down so much that these wonderful neural models working so well in domain, they become worse than BM25 out of domain, which is kind of ridiculous, right? It, go, it, it throws us back uh, 15 years ago. So, yeah, I think that in domain, out of domain, there's definitely a lot to that that we can unpack. Um, but I guess kind of like this idea of having an in domain model for your particular application, like um, I kind of wonder about the zero shot and whether you need that. Like, I think it's a great thing to get started. But once you have some data set and you have some queries for whether you're building like a finance search app or a Twitter search app, or like I'm working on the WeVA podcast search app, so I'll search through this transcript, right? So like I, I'm thinking like, um, you know, having, I could use something like in pairs to generate my data set and then train my cross encoder on that data set. And then I can, you know, re-rank within domain. And it kind of makes me wonder, and it feels accessible to me because, you know, like these um, cross encoders are like text classifiers. Maybe you can shed some more insight onto the difficulties of training cross encoders, but to me, it seems like a, you know, not the most complicated deep learning optimization task to train a text classifier. 
Oh, oh yeah. Uh, training cross encoders. Um, I, I, I love to train cross encoders and I hate to train by encoders. I, I did it. <laughs> the, uh, the cross encoders, the, um, uh, so the cross encoders versus by encoders, we probably should have, uh, said, talked more a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of, of both types of models. So for cross encoders, they're really easy to train, but they are slow unless you're using them in their ranking mode. The good news is that in many domains, BM25 already generates a list of candidates that is pretty good. And uh, these models can be, some of these models can be pretty cheap to run. With bioencoders, uh, they're difficult to train. They converge really poorly. Um, and they, uh, but they, again, the advantage is that you can potentially, uh, you know, make retrieval faster because you don't, maybe need that ranking step or make it less necessary. Uh, so yeah, in terms of the, but both models require a lot of data to train. Um, and what was, ex it, it was difficult before this, like this data typically needs to be manually created. And what's again, another, um, another difference between the NLP domain and uh, information retrieval domain. So if you, tell somebody like pick a random NLP person and tell them that you have difficulty annotating 1000 queries. Then I was like, Oh, like what's, what's the big deal with a thousand queries, 1000 examples, basically that's kind of the light bulb that goes on in the mind of uh, your typical NLP researcher, but no, 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 no. You have to annotate the query. What does it entail? You say uh, for each query, you run some candidate generator or use a bunch of retrieval system that produce results. The more the area, they need to be diverse, and then find some a bunch of documents. And ideally, you get like hundreds of those. Some of those are going to be relevant, some of those are going to be non-relevant. And then an assessor, or maybe a couple of assessors, and those are people who are judging, um, mm -hmm. would go and read these documents at least briefly. And for the hundred document, so this is enormous annotation effort. So uh, it's even if it's like really sparsely judged, it's still like one thousand. You need to read a few thousand documents to annotate one thousand queries. It's much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the data is a huge problem, and zero shot doesn't always work. And moreover, what's interesting when the zero shot is working well, and that that result comes from um, from the great work of Rodrigo Nogueira in uh, um, some of his quarters that some of the models, they do transfer really well, but they typically need to be large, and not just large, huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so something like 3 billion or 10 billion parameter models. We are not going to put those in production anytime soon, maybe not even within a couple of decades. So that, that's that's a big, big, big issue. Um, so we, ideally, we want to uh, train models that are small. So how do we get data? And uh, except annotating that manually, and, and, Although there, there was some work on self-supervised learning in the IR domain, but again, things are more, remember, things are more difficult in the IR domain. It was much less, uh, for example, the Contriver paper. There was much, and before that, we had embeddings, which are typically much worse than BM25, like averaged embeddings. Um, they are worse un, un, unless that's a very specific some domains in some domains they do these things do work well, but say not for MS Marco, not for legal uh, retrieval. Um, and yeah, so those like self supervised appro training approaches they um, don't work well. And there was recently there were a couple of exciting papers, one coming uh, from Rodrigo and uh, his group uh, called Inpars, and another was like slightly preceding work UPR. And uh, shortly after that, the prompt a gator paper as a follow up to it parse. And these are the three, uh, three papers that showed oh, you can use uh, a large language model to either generate uh, training data from LLM for retrieval successfully, or you can use um, LLM directly as a pre trained LLM as a re ranker. And that was the UPR paper that um, we also cite. So, uh, and obviously, in Parse and Propagator, they are much more um, practical in the sense that they, instead of re ranking using a large model, they are basically using prompting, prompt engineering to distill the information from the large language model to a smaller 
Rancor or PTO model. And that makes things much more practical. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to there's definitely a lot to unpack. I think the the distilling part, I'm very interested in that and kind of different from the knowledge distillation where you use the large model to label the data and then you learn those labels. The synthetic data generation thing is a different case where you just generate the data to distill it like in the data space rather than just like the pseudo labeling label space. But uh, quickly, I just you, there's one detail you mentioned that I really wanted to unpack a little more and about the relevance judgments for training cross encoders. And I know we have like this NDCG metric where we say label the relevance of documents and say like a scale, like a three level scale, like, you know, this is a three, this is a three, this is a three, this is a two, this is one, 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 zero, zero. Right? So um, like... How important is that label, like multiple relevance labeling, having labeling multiple relevant documents per query for the sake of training these cross encoders? Oh, um, that's more than one question. Um, so first of all, it's uh, it's great point that the distillation through prompting that was. Uh, used in NINPARS and Promptigator is so much different from the classic uh, distillation through Kayla versions that we typically do. Uh, and I would want to address this uh, question first because uh, it's. I, I think it's still, uh, It's there is work showing that it may still be possible to do the more standard uh, distillation as well. So the, um, the UPR paper, the... Um, I, I hope I not mispronounced the name like by Sachin at all. Uh, what they originally showed that they can re-rank using a big model and uh, the uh, they have a follow-up paper where they show that you can actually use scale diversions to distill that knowledge from the main model to the uh, to a smaller ranker. So that seems to be possible too. Uh, but another, uh, yeah, uh, but what the, the promptigator and imparse found apparently, so it's easier to use prompts to actually uh, use prompting as, as a generation of synthetic examples and some sort of proxy for this distillation of the knowledge. Well, that said, I think what's, what's important, I mean, these are sort of technicalities, but what's important, I think the one uh, important um piece of information, one important insight here is that um, we have something to distill. And that's a really good question how this happens. So I remember I mentioned before that um, IR is a difficult domain for machine learning because, well, for many reasons, in, in uh, this query document similarity features are harder to, um, to somehow for ML. And before uh, before all those exciting developments, there was a lot of um, work on unsupervised, uh, like doc to vec style, word to vec style embeddings, and they don't work well. And they were, and one reason why they didn't work well because they were trained in self supervised fashion without direct supervision, and we know that it didn't work well for IR. Moreover, it worked mostly mostly didn't work well, and it worked really poorly. So then BERT appeared. At first, people tried when BERT appeared. BERT, if people, probably people are familiar that with BERT, BERT can provide embeddings for text as well. Although these embeddings, a lot of people, including actually Niels, who was on the podcast, they quickly noticed that those embeddings are not good for retrieval. For something like sentence retrieval, yes, can use it, but, but query to documentary doesn't work. So self-supervision doesn't work. Uh, then you would need a ton of supervised data and by encoder, which is like really tricky to train. Now we have models that uh, are trained uh, using self-supervision and now they work for retrieval. So something changed and and, and that, that wasn't present before. So, and we don't know exactly what is it like a scale of the data. Is it what, uh, is it the way how these models are trained? So, so yeah, so that's um, and that's why uh, in, in, in that's why for us in in parse light paper, which is in fact basically a reproduction paper, which is very incremental with respect to that 
much more fundamental work, but we tried to answer a couple of uh, important questions such as can we make it even more practical? And another question is, um, is it really the scale, just the scale of that next talking prediction training that makes the model learn something about IR as well, which didn't happen before? And to do so, we need to take, um, we need to use a purely open source model like Bloom because we can trust that they train it like this way and didn't fine tune it on any IR data sets or even something like IRish, which cannot be, we cannot be sure if you take GPT 3. Do you know how it was trained? No, I don't know. So mm -hmm. it's, uh... yeah, I love those details of the paper, like the um, the Bloom seven billion, the maybe the GPT J model, also these open source language models to generate the training data, which are also a little more accessible. Because I think like with the GPT three Da Vinci, like at the pricing of recording this podcast, it's like going to be probably like a cent per you know generation, sort of around that. So you know five thousand yeah, scaling it. So it makes it seems a lot uh, very useful to be testing if the smaller generative models can produce good synthetic data as well. And then also the smaller rankers, because in the end, you use the 30 million parameter uh, mini LM architecture based ranker model. So uh, maybe could we touch a little more about the inference requirements of the rankers? Because, uh, uh, well, I guess these just just inference topic in general, because like the ranker is, you know, if you have like a 3 billion parameter ranker, or you mentioned the log prop of the language model to get the score to re-rank that you're going to be waiting waiting for the re-ranking forever oh yeah um yeah so so basically uh like our paper although it did get some positive feedback uh it's it's really uh it's really a very incremental reproduction paper but what i <laughs> so uh, so it was uh in fact not my main work project it was a side kick um, I supervised the team of master's students and, and CMU, and I was doing things jointly with them, not just supervising them. So they implemented, in fact, some key component, how to generate these synthetic queries. And then I took this and um, I, I, I ran I ran these experiments, most of the experiments. And, and yeah, uh, and so originally the question was, was that, yeah, GPT-3 is somewhat expensive. So can we make it cheaper by using the open source model? But that's not not all the story. Uh, that's um, this is the part where uh, Rodrigo Nogueira's team with uh, Bonifacio and, and all that they scooped us a little bit because they showed in the follow up paper yes you can replace GPT three. But what they didn't try to do they didn't try to replace the huge model with something that is uh, really much more practical. And that's something that what we did. So the cross encoders, they, uh, although they can have reasonable uh, requirements, they can be applied only uh, inference times. They can be applied only to um, to like small subsets of documents. So in, even uh, with the, I don't remember inference times for a bigger model, but even for like 30 million parameter models on just with general PyTorch without much optimization, it's something like um, I, I think a few thousand documents per second on a modern GPU, which uh, which means you can't afford the ranking more than a couple hundred documents retrieved, say, by PM45. And it's actually much worse if you try the model that is 300 million parameters, you multiply it by 510, and another 10 multiply if you take the models that... Uh, Rodrigo Nogueira's team was using with like 3 billion parameters, probably also like five times, another five times slow or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think it'll be really great, like uh, sort of like blog post content around Weaviate is getting these numbers out of like how long it takes to re-rank 1,100 documents with, e with each parameter size uh, transformer-based cross encoder. Uh, it, yeah, it's super interesting because the, the 30 million, right, it could re-rank it super fast. And, and uh, I also maybe... Because I think like people are used to like, I'd say like sub 30, 50 millisecond vector search and BM25 search. So I, because I, I, I just like you said, a, a rank a few thousand documents in a second with a cross encoder. Because I'm just curious if I heard that detail right. Because with my experiments, it's been to re rank like a thousand documents. I'm probably looking at like, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. Uh, which models do you use? I, so usually I'm using the sentence transformers cross encoders and uh, yeah maybe like 80 million parameters scale just like uh, 
testing it. But uh, yeah, maybe just for, because I think I'm missing a huge part of my knowledge now. How are you uh, optimizing the cross encoders for inference? Um, I, I, I didn't. And I, I think it may be uh, dependent a little bit on the GPU that you're using. Um, but for the uh, for the for the thirty million parameter model that I I was using, I, I did measure the times, and it's for one hundred documents, it's something like 0. 0.3 second for one hundred. Um, yeah, so the uh, you can rank one thousand. In some cases, you probably would need to do so, and it's going to be um, more expensive. But I think that in many uh, in many cases, people deal with smaller collections where ranking 100 is enough. And in fact, that was one thing that we changed between the, when we did reproduction, but that one thing that we changed between in parse paper and our reproduction is that they were ranking 1000 documents. We were ranking 100 and with somewhat, uh, with somewhat biggish model, like having like 400 million parameters, we basically match the numbers on most collections we get in the neighborhood of the numbers while we're ranking only 100 documents. So this already shaves off uh, an order of magnitude. So, um, and also another thing that if going from uh, 400 million to 30 million parameter models is also much more uh, efficient, although the results are not as good. So it's um, an open research question somewhat open research question, how to make it even more effective. But um, what I should have mentioned before, I think it's it's a step forward. It's not definitely not a solution of the problem, uh, but it's a step forward. In particular, if you uh, look at the paper of the like Kinpars, they use two models. One is as big as our biggest model, a little bit, and the, the same, same order of magnitude, um, 300, 200 or 300 million parameters. And with that model, they do not beat BM25 at all, just except for MS Markov's parse uh, and uh, track. So only on one collection, they, they can do it. And we take a 30 million parameter model, and we were able to consistently outperform BM25 on all the collections they, they were using. So it's definitely a step forward. Um, yeah, so um, people, I'm pretty sure people will optimize this recipe even further and will get some. Yeah, I think like, because um, I haven't done things like even just like, you know, maybe just the Onyx optimizations, the maybe compiling it to the NVIDIA Triton server. And we're also really excited about neural magic and the sparse inference acceleration, all the kind of things we can do to make it run faster. And uh, so I also think kind of this topic, um, like I think as we're thinking about this retrieval augmented large language model thing, you might be willing to wait a little longer for the re-ranking also because, you know, you're going to pay for all these generations. So, you know, if you're searching, like, let's say I'm simulating my interview with Leo and, and, and I'm, uh, and I want, and I, um, and I'm, and I want to like practice my podcast and I'm talking about in pairs light and I want it to retrieve some passage and I have this big corpus, like I'm willing to wait, you know, two more seconds for it to get that top result that will help supplement the language model to ground the context and then pretend to be Leo in my use of the language model. So yeah, so maybe we could talk about just this general space of retrieval augmented large language models sort of pivoting topics a bit. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit lost. Do you want me to touch like, kind of the develop the topic of efficiency a little bit more or? Yeah, if you're interested in doing that, for sure. I, I Yeah, sorry, that was kind of <laughs> it was like a loosely tied together <laughs> transition. But yeah, this so I, the, I, send, I kind of see like the value of re-ranking is in, increasing with the large language model. Oh, I see. Uh, well, first of all, um, the the re ranking can be relatively cheap, so that's that's again, um, as you mentioned, people sometimes people can wait if you're doing an enterprise search and something within one second is probably uh, a possibility. So, uh, thirty million parameter model is definitely practical, and. Um, but you probably need still need to run it on some GPU-ish device. Mm -hmm. So something like, I think there may be M1 uh, hybrid CPU, GPU mm -hmm. probably would be required um, or like pretty multi-core CPU. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But the second thing, of course, uh, in can be possible again, uh, combine it with uh, the retrievers 
as well. I we didn't train retrievers because unlike in Parr's paper, in, in, pro, sorry, pro, propagated paper, who trained uh, retrievers, and that can be uh, if you train a retriever, what happens with the retriever? The retriever is like bioencoder model. It can be pretty accurate on its own. Yes, every ranker adds something on top of that, but it's usually like 10, 15%. So if you have um, a, a, a retriever, you can, in fact, re rank fewer candidate records. So instead of, say, 100, you would re rank only like 30. So that's, or instead of 1,000, you would re rank 100. So that makes it a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, more feasible. And with, uh, retrievers, you can invest more into like use bigger models because you kind of shift it to the indexing time. Mm. Yeah, so that's something to try. Uh, and with for for for, yeah. So um, yeah, so that's basically uh, you can wait a little bit longer. You can use bioencoders. You can use uh, slightly faster computing devices, and you can use a more optimized um, environment. I'm not sure about the neural magic because I haven't uh, played with it myself, but uh, I know that it's like on, C on, on the, there are cheap GPUs now, like what things that are like, that are comparable in speed to old Titan. Mm -hmm. And they have some like, they're very cheap. And, and why not use them? If they're even cheaper than maybe than CPU, why not use them for inference? Yeah, I think um, just, yeah, on the neural magic side of like, it's like this combination of things with like sparsifying the models, lower precision, taking advantage of like the CPU cache hierarchy. Uh, if people are curious, so we have an interview with Michael Goyne who explains all the details of that. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, super cool. And I thought that trade off you mentioned was so interesting of the, um, of like how you want to think about putting your resources towards optimizing the bi encoder, like vector embedding models with the cross encoder re ranker models. And how if you have really good bi encoders, then you would only need to re rank 30, and then you could have a higher capacity re ranker, like 3 billion parameters, because you're only re ranking 30. Or, or this other kind of thinking where you're like, we're going to throw it all into the learning to rank kind of thinking where you're like, let's get like a thousand from BM25, a thousand from vector search, and just into this 30 million parameter ranker, which is like the engine to fix it. I, that trade-off is super powerful, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. So you can, uh, in fact, as I said, uh, the, the old-style IR can still, gig, like in the in the case of QA collection, I'm, I'm guilty I haven't published that paper. I should, uh, that showing that actually really can get, it's not only like vector retrieval that, that can be helpful. And, uh, yeah, and the advantage, although there is some work published on that, but the gains that I get there, they are actually not that big. I think you can, um, can you can, uh, I should publish a more compelling paper, basically saying that um, you can uh, use BM25, rank just like really a lot of uh, BM25 entries using old style tech or mm -hmm. like modernized old style tech, which runs on CPU, it runs fast. Mm -hmm. And then it gives still you like almost almost like close to vector by encoder like style quality, and then you can use a ranker. And that said, I'm not like particularly attached to rankers themselves. We had, um, I think it was more for the paper itself. It was more important to show that you can replace GPT three, and not only that, uh, we got thanks for the uh, for the Inpars paper authors who big thanks. Uh, twin parts uh, paper authors who uh, released all the generated queries so we were able mm. to directly compare regenerate sort of the same using the same documents but using only the generation was done using bloom and uh, gptj i think and we were able to compare against the quality and we could see that yes we we get results that are better than gpt3 results um so that was an important question and answer. The second question, would we be able somehow get models that are much smaller? Um, that was, uh, that was, and again, uh, we got scooped in part in, on both of these research questions by a propagator paper or by in parse version two paper. Uh, but I do think there is value to our findings as well. And it's also 
nice to have like independent confirmation of of ideas mm -hmm. that's for practitioners it's probably very useful as a as a signal yeah i thought i love that idea of open sourcing uh the synthetic data sets like the um you know, I, I love Hugging Face Model Hub. As you mentioned, like the open source generative models being a huge part of this and um, like open sourcing the generated data set, the, the data set hub papers with data also has like the collection of data sets. Yeah, I've been so interested in wanting to participate in this kind of thinking around the science. Like we are working on like the beer data sets. And so I'm planning on, you know, putting these in Google buckets and then you can restore Weave8 instances that have like the BM25 search, the HNSW index already. But that like publishing of the, like GPT three generated synthetic data set to expand like NF corpus or, you know, the beer data sets and this kind of idea, I find it so interesting. So, so in the podcast, I'd like to kind of like really transition topics. Um, yeah. Can you tell me about like your sort of your origin story of how you came into be working on search and then particularly this non-metric space? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So that that's a little bit the this to my story is uh, a little bit unusual if not to say it it's quite unusual because um i'm not like your typical uh not your typical uh, researcher and uh so I, I i was working in the industry for quite a while um and then i i got my phd basically very recently um mid-career but one important reason why this happened because the the country from which i originated mm -hmm. it it stopped to exist and all the science that that wasn't that country to is basically there was no funding there was no way you can go and get uh do one research and although the fundamental education like remained strong they like the only like opportunities were like go and you know work on financial systems databases and things like that um, but i got bored by this pretty quickly and um talking about how i, I can uh, automate this stuff like gui creation and mm -hmm. uh, uh writing of sql queries yeah the, this this stuff is pretty repetitive so probably a lot of that can be automated uh, but anyway, so I got of course i was interested more like in research and uh, at the moment that was like basically late uh it was like 30 no it was a little bit more than 20 years ago the the only like ai of which um it was basically search and search engines was a big topic that we, we we had google that you know um and that's how i got interested in retrieval algorithms and i was uh doing that that stuff part-time and at some point like i talked with my family uh that they um, and they basically supported my decision to go get like a formal degree because unfortunately in our society it's really hard if you don't you come from nowhere you're not being treated seriously in yeah you will not just get like good authors yeah it's uh, some there are some stories of people going to I don't know some engineering job and then they merge as researchers. There is one interesting case of uh, of um, the author of uh, Chain of Thought Prompting. That's an interesting story. They're interesting, but they're rare. Very rare cases that happen. So basically, yeah. Um, and that's how I got interested in retrieval. Um, and that's, I, I didn't plan to work on retrieval while in my PhD program. But I joined uh, a lab um, whose PI, like Eric Nyberg, was participating in that IBM Watson project. And for me, that was like super flashy and super AI beating human champions. But after like reading and learning about the topic, what we quickly realized that, oh, IBM Watson system is actually is not is is pretty simple. It is basically a retrieval augmented um model what we have now retrieval augmented nlp that's what it was the retrieval uh the retrieval based qa system um, and that's how i came back to work a little bit more on the retrieval because i decided that you can uh, retrieve the you can improve the the retrieval component uh, that's that will retrieve the perform improve the performance of the whole system the qa system 
And now answering your question, a little bit long-winded explanation about how non-metric search came into place. So the the non-metric we have like in uh, in the real world we have distance, which is Euclidean distance, and has a bunch of nice properties, and it has satisfies that axioms of the metric space. But there are a bun bunch of similarity metrics, or so we don't normally call them distances, who are wrong. They not, do not satisfy our intuitions of the 3D world. And they are non-metric, like the Cassine similarity, the KL divergence, they're all. But they can still be useful because they're used as a, a similarity function to compare queries and documents. And so the idea was coming from that old uh, feature engineering world. So you can compute that similarity you have uh, a data analyst that would compute, uh, that create these uh, features, combine them, and that would be some combination that would not be nice. And they would need a special kind of system that would uh, support retrieval using this similarity function. Uh, so sorry, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So it's like a learned function uh, for, the <laughs> for the distance, because that sounds a lot like the cross encoder to me. Uh, I, I, I know that sounds like really alien to people because uh, nowadays, in like recent years, we made a huge progress in representation learning. So basically, you can compute very good representations and compare them using the Euclidean distance. Or the cosine similarity between normalized representation is basically the Euclidean distance. Uh, and that's all you need. It's just everything else, like neural network, um, job to make this representation comparable using a simple similarity measure. But in the old days, uh, people would create multiple features. And the idea was that, oh, so these multiple features, there will be complex function. People were contemplating some expensive similarities, something like earth mover distance, mm. which is uh, really inefficient to compute, but people like like there is a paper, uh, I think uh, there that's using uh, this earth mover distance to compute more than bearings with some small gains. Uh, and although earth mover distance, I think it's still metric, but you want some some system that, but it's it's a generic metric. It's much harder to do retrieval with this generic metric because it's not Euclidean. So uh, it's not even like vector space distance. So there was that idea that, oh, let's, uh, let's help analysts by building, providing them with tools that would support retrieval using these complicated similarity measures. Yeah, so I remember setting like a Wasserstein GAN where they use like that earth movers distance. Um, do you mind explaining that from the beginning? What, what the difference is between earth movers distance and uh, so it's like optimal transport, like what the difference is between that and then just like a KL divergence between vectors? Um, I have to tell you that I don't remember very specific nuances of how earth movers distance is calculated. But um, as far as I remember, it is not, it is not represented you cannot represent it by something like take vector coordinates to just like compare them like in the Euclidean distance. You can't just, you have a bunch of simple distances, the Euclidean distance, the LP matrix, and the, the KL divergence, they're still pretty simple because you just compare uh, pairwise, you do pairwise coordinate comparisons. Comparisons, I, I quote unquote, because you do some operations like either you subtract them and square, or like in KL divergence, it's a little bit more involved. But basically, these are pairwise operations, which are often that you just can simulate via the inner product computation. And then it's a simple operation in the vector space. But in a more generic uh, way, you can consider a generic vector, not a vector space, generic space that doesn't have a notion of these simple vectors mm -hmm. or they are not compared so easily. But they still, that would space, it would be called something like a metric space. And um, it would have some axioms in particular, metric space satisfies the triangle inequality symmetry. And you might be you might envision searching in this space 
without using vectors directly, just distance computations. Mm. Yeah, I think about it like um, I don't have like a piece of paper on the desk, but like I crumple up a piece of paper and that's kind of how I think about like what a manifold is, like a discrete topological structure where you can't, you can't, or you know, my hand right now is a manifold. Like I can't do distance from here to here because this doesn't exist sort of. That's sort of like how I've been thinking about that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, maybe I, I know it's getting a little distract, a little off topic, but do you, do you have an interest in things like category theory and these kind of topics? Um, not really familiar, but I think the, the manifold example is interesting in that um, it's a good illustration that you can reason about this space in abstract ways. Like you have some certain restrictions. You can go from here to here, but not from, from another point. But at the same time, you don't reason in terms of explicitly in terms of coordinates. Mm. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the uh, search function because your search function is going to be restricted. The you, you have less information about the space, and that's that's going to be big restrictions. But what's interesting um, that there was an that 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 uh, sequence not sequence of uh, there is that uh, a class of algorithms that rely on building neighborhood graphs, mm. which surprisingly uh, people realize gradually that those alg algorithms are, are, are sufficiently generic to provide a retrieval in in the case where you don't have those explicit vector space coordinates and not only that they can oftentimes beat those uh, algorithms that are designed uh, specifically for this knowing like having this coordinate system and access to individual coordinates and they can be so we have that um yeah and once once i realized that i could use these kind of algorithms and i i i saw the research opportunity which ended uh in the that was a dead end to a large degree unfortunately but it may be useful in, in the future and we also helped uh helped promote these approaches which were also super useful for uh, distances like the Euclidean distance as well as for inner product search and cosine similarity based search. It, yeah, it's amazing. I, I think the whole like graph representation learning, which is usually like, let's try to get the graph into a continuous space. Let's try to get the graph into a Euclidean space so we can like do all these things. I, I also find it so fascinating the the HNSW like the the graph index that's paired with the way that you organize the Euclidean space distance measures. Do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have like anything super concrete. I'm just kind of like thinking out loud with this, but yeah, it's so interesting. So, can we also talk about? Um, so, you developed this Flex New Art library. You developed the HNSW lib and uh, NMS lib. Uh, can you tell me about your experience developing a library to organize your experiments and communicate your research this way? Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I wasn't like the only the, the person working on this. And then um, the, the that with respect to that graph-based retrieval algorithms, I I helped to promote it. I was I created the first optimized version of that that um, to some degree was was reused, but then we, of course, like our most efficient implementation was contributed by Yuri Malkov. Uh, but more generally, um, that project was, uh, in terms of organization of the, 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 the research, it's actually quite interesting that uh, that project started as the PhD project of um, another person, Bilik Naidan, who also contributed quite a lot to it. Um, and at some point, like everybody is using the Python version, Python binding. He created the first Python bindings. You can't. It wouldn't have been possible to do anything useful without Python bindings. Um, yeah, but that that started as his PhD project, and we had no um, graph algorithms at that point. Uh, these were his interest was in this retrieval and generic metric spaces. So we did a little bit of, of work on this topic and uh, it was basically two of us. Um, and then we had a couple more people joining our the project. So it was like, you know, like sort of random alignment of people on their interests and, uh, um, and their contributions. And I was kind of holding that um, animously project together. So 
uh, doing uh, actually a lot of uh, the software engineering job, the uh, some of the running some of the experiments, and we published uh, a couple of papers on that non-metric search, uh, and also maintaining it and um, yeah, doing things like that. Basically, even like encouraging people to to contribute. Although it wasn't a big project, it was a small collaboration. It was a little bit. It is actually a little bit different with uh, FlexNoart because FlexNoart is um, the retrieval toolkit that uh, is basically separate from Anima Sleep, and it uh, just incorporates all the, the good stuff like BM25 and KNN Search. And that was solely, at some point, it was like 100% mine project, and uh, what I'm trying to do, I'm, I work with people, and um, whatever we do jointly for the information retrieval, we're trying to uh, reuse this library. And I also... I, I it, it it actually started it, it it started as from it comes from my PhD thesis so I used it and I you know it's like I improved a little bit and a little bit and then a little bit more and then it um, it becomes more useful with time. Yeah, it's really interesting, and I I would think that like Weaviate could be used for a lot of this IR research as well, where you could. You know, you have the you can build off the implementation of HSW product quantization, like as disk ANN is developed and these kind of things. And I guess like my thinking is like the library it adds value in. Sometimes they have like the data sets are built in, so like some of these IR data sets is really easy to load the data because you don't have to clean it; it's already clean. And sort of a part of the library as well as these indexing algorithms and sort of like the whole ranking flow. Yeah, so I guess like um, what do you think are the this might be too open-ended of a question, but like, what are the most important things for an information retrieval research library to contribute to the science to, you know, be used? <laughs> oh, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a great question. And that's a very open-ended one. I don't have definitive answers. So the, uh, I think the animal sleep definitely uh, was useful. And that's kind of funny because I, I, I don't have a key contribution to that library and it still uh, wouldn't have existed without me or like Billy. And then um, one thing that it should be useful in some ways, it should, uh, that there should be some missing elements. Like in Animal Sleep, we had methods that uh, before us, nobody was, or like few people uh, seriously considered them as, um, as, you know, something to be used. Um, that's like one missing missing piece of science. It's uh, another thing is the ease of use, mm. and I think say with the Nemo Sleep, we um, we were able to largely to a large degree achieve this. So first, uh, Billy created these Python bindings, and then I got help from another person to make it like you know deployment easy and installation on. Mm. Um, Computers that you don't have to compile, you'll get some pre-compiled binary. Definitely ease of use. You just do pipe by. and uh, also uh, on a bunch of operating systems, ease of use. Definitely, it should be it should it should be no pain for people to install. Um, the it was great point about downloading data sets, and I personally underestimated this part for a while. And FlexNord doesn't have this ability, but I see what PySerene is doing. And I mm -hmm. definitely want to appeal for that for them from them. I don't want to support a lot of data sets um, because it's like you know it's difficult. But like basically, like I say I want to convert beer data sets and MS mm -hmm. Marco and store it in the cloud so people when they use FlexNord and say BM25 indexes from FlexNord, they can just basically mm -hmm. uh, run a command and then it will download uh, things as well. So what else install like ease of use? It should it should it should be yeah somehow uh, it should have some there should be some missing is some missing piece of science or technology mm. that that people need. And and last but not least, I think I should have said that maybe earlier. Um, promotion makes a huge difference. Mm. Yeah, mm. so people should know you should just. Writing something beautiful and putting it out on GitHub, nobody knows. Uh, sometimes word of mouth works, but you know you compete with Google and Facebook and uh, others. Whenever like you get good results on some leaderboards, you publish papers, you 
then people you know get people mm-hmm. interested so that's i think an important component too yeah super interesting i think to build on the data sets part you've done some work on long document uh benchmarks and i i think this is a very interesting topic that hasn't really been covered like if we're going to rank you know if we're going to search through entire scientific papers sort of can you sort of just like set the stage of of the distinction in long document and sort of how this hasn't been studied as much as you know, MS Marco natural questions like that whole tour of the beer data sets? Yeah, so that's um, that's that's a great question. That's actually one of the uh, important limitations of the transformer models, which currently I feel is being removed now, at least like mitigated. But originally, the, the way the BERT was created, it had to, um, it still has, if you use that original BERT model, it ha- had a limit on the number of input tokens it could process, and it's only 512. Mm. And it's not a whole lot, right? So and if you have a long document, you need to classify it, or you have to do something. And there is a bunch of algorithms that are doing some sort of clever chunking aggregation of results. Mm-hmm. And um, that's uh, that was something to benchmark and um, compare for the paper. Um, that said, I feel like the community has made like really great progress on removing that um, limitation, mm-hmm. and with uh, approaches like flash attention, I think we'll soon have uh, transformer models that will support very long inputs up to few thousand, few thousand more than ten thousand tokens. Um, it's. I think it's a matter of time, but it, it should happen. Yeah, I think there's kind of like um, maybe um, yeah. So that that idea of like flash attention, I've seen like staircase attention. I, I went to Neurops this year and I saw a lot of the posters are like, here's our sparse attention, our take on sparse attention. Right? It's like uh, this linear attention kind of technique, and and I certainly agree. Like things like the Cerebras chip as being one like big chips that get that let you put in massive inputs to the transformers that I find that whole thing to be incredibly interesting. But maybe if I could pitch you this other idea on what we're thinking with, uh, with a long document representation where like our, so our VVA data model is like classes and then like references to other classes. So we think about it like article has passage, passage. And so like article has passage, 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 passage. <laughs> like, and then, um, and so one way would be, to represent the whole article, you would have the vectors of each chunk, and then you would average the vectors from the chunk to represent the article. Another idea would be maybe we like cluster the uh, passages, and then we have like three centroids that represent the article. And then a newer idea with ChatGPT, expensive, but it, it could—it's an idea—is that you would uh, you would su- you would say like, please summarize these passages. So like you you go one by one through the passages, and then update the summary, and then from that represents the article. So what do you think about that kind of like graph structured way of representing like abstract long document object with these chunks? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, there, that, there is definitely a bunch of way how to uh, chunk data and aggregate it and represent in the, the space. I, am, I have to tell you that I have, to, I have to give a disclaimer that I'm not particularly a knowledgeable person in, in, in for this kind of work uh, in... Yeah, basically, I didn't work in that domain much. Uh, but, it's my, yeah, you can do interesting things. You can do embeddings, and then you can do something probably like graph neural network mm-hmm. based on the top of that. Again, how well it works, I can't tell. Uh, but um, I, I can tell you that there, there are definitely efficiency issues because what we see a lot of times that... Uh, Things that work best are trained end to end, meaning that, like you, you say, you have a graph, mm-hmm. you have like embedding for each node, you embed it, and basically your neural, you, you feed a large chunk or like the whole graph, sort of into your, like the whole document, or the graph of the document into that neural network, and then embeddings are being, although embeddings might be somewhat pre-computed, warmed up. But in the end, you want to run these end-to-end compute gradients, propagate them all the way through the network. Because if you don't do this, your your representations, you don't know how good they are, right? Like coming back to that example to BERT, which is trained in self-supervised fashion, but whose representations are not good enough for retrieval. So it can be something like that. 
and then you need in the end fine tune the whole uh, thing again, and that's expensive. So the the modern accelerators they don't have enough memory for long documents, so that's that's one limitations that I would I would think of, and then you can be clever and somehow split. Um, but how well it works, I cannot comment because I don't have first hand experience. Yeah, that's a that's a, such an interesting topic because the graph neural networks, to me, like the big appeal of it is how well it can handle uh, like variable size input. So like one article might have five passages, the next has like 30. And then the graph neural network, I think like the end to end thing is very like in the graph neural network sense to stay on that. I think it would be like you update the original, like you send gradients all the way back to the input would be maybe how you would try to do it end to end. And you get like new embeddings that way, sort of that are synced up with like the context of the graph. But, yeah. but, but then you like, I find it very hard to believe that there'll be like zero shot graph neural networks that, that like represent aggregates of embeddings for long document representations. Like I think you'd need to train this on your particular uh, thing. Yes. Oh, I, I totally, I totally agree with you that we, um, the there is a relatively poor transferability of neural networks to new domain and tasks, and although uh, OpenAI made some great progress on in some domains, like with a clip model, uh, but I think it's still, you know, because we are. Uh, Oftentimes, it's still like really difficult in many practical situations to do this transformation. Although there will be some progress, there will. Be some. It's it's an interesting topic and it's a complicated one. And I again, I have to. I can only. Re I, I should probably repeat the disclaimer that I'm. Um, that's that's not that's not my, you know, uh, that's not my primary expertise this more structured objects regretfully so i cannot tell you what works and what what not what doesn't work in this uh, space yeah i think it's a pretty cutting edge topic uh, in, from my understanding i know there are definitely some graph neural networks uh, experts out there in the world but um i think this is a good like not leaving the graph neural network thing in the past, <laughs> talking about the um, the in domain, out of domain. So, we're, we're, you know, we're kind of talking about like this idea that you, if you want to have a graph neural network that can represent like your cross reference schema, you would need to fine tune it in domain on your problem. And one of the big arguments around out of domain, in domain, the, one of the key things to be mindful of is robustness, this topic of like robust generalization, the out of domain models being really good at being robust relative to in domain. Like uh, there's this great paper called wise FT where they take the clip model off the shelf that's trained on something like lay on. I don't think it's, I don't think the clip data set is open source as far as I'm aware. Uh, and they fine tune it for particular image text data sets. And they show that like, you know, like the out of domain model is, is more robust. So uh, Leah, I know you've done some work on robustness. Can you sort of explain what robustness, robust generalization is? Oh yeah, sure. So the uh, well, first of all, when we t talk about robustness, we uh, typically separate uh, it into natural robustness and adversarial robustness. And what I worked more on was uh, actually adversarial robustness. Although we did some work on the um, natural uh, natural generalization and natural robustness for the. Uh, information table too, but basically the the idea is, is very simple, and I think you explain it it really well. There was a very good example. So you take it something that is trained for one type of data, we call it domain, and apply it to another type of data, which is another domain, and things don't work as well. And we call it distribution shift, although uh, there is no real distribution. And some people like oh, like what's distribution here? But it, it's a it's a common terminology. We we somehow envision a, a, a probabilistic data generation process that generated data in one domain, generated data in another domain, and in fact there may be some because how you sample is is a generative process, and then there is some some mismatch between properties and because our algorithms are statistical, so if there is difference in statistics between these domains, it's sort of inevitable that you would um, you would get uh, this. Um, differences. And with adversarial uh, robustness, we want to, it, it's actually really, I think it's probably going to be, um, it's not, it, it, it's, it's going to be a little bit on off topic uh, because with adversarial robustness, we assume that uh, malicious users can modify inputs in a way that would completely 
um, change model prediction in the way that you want it. It's a it's a really huge problem in in like academically, and it's not there are no easy ways to solve it apparently. But I think it's actually doesn't um, it's not clear if it has a big um, practical impact because it's difficult to attack these models in practice. It's easy in the digital domain, but you never know the model. You you can't usually control the inputs at the say pixel level, or, so it's difficult. Um, and with text, you don't have access to gradients because that's discrete discrete thing. But I think the natural robustness is, is a much more important topic for everybody. Oh. Oh, natural wait. robustness and the distribution shift is something that we should really care about, at least in the near future. Awesome. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag in the connection, but uh, it's all back to good. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I like this example of like, it's like they have the self-driving car and it's like, oh no, an adversarial optimized stop sign. Like that kind of like, you look at like the the brain of the network to optimize with gradients, some kind of imperceptible thing. Yeah, I also don't, am not super interested in that, but I'm interested in the general thing of like, if uh, like say you want to test the robustness of your text search system by uh, generating paraphrases of the queries and seeing if the paraphrase of the query returns like far different search results than the original query or like the image analog would be you have like an image and you rotate it or you horizontally flip it, increase the brightness, these kind of augmentations, and that produces like totally different search results. So how do you see robustness uh, impacting search? Oh, um, that's, yeah, that's definitely a great question. And the I do see robustness uh, being a huge topic for neural networks because uh, it will frustrate users who do not understand why, exactly why they change the inputs a little bit, and that would break systems. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that all those systems are breakable. There is no easy solution what... Uh, that I am aware of, and I think to things that work uh, somewhat reliably, in as was demonstrated, it's it's another you know talking about there is that concept of bitter pill in machine learning, that no matter how smart we are, just bigger models and and more data helps us. So I think in terms of robustness, it's probably um, we need again the the practical sort of the the only practical uh, remedies that we have now. Uh, train more generic models on more data. That's what OpenAI are doing, and train models that are bigger. And of course, both solutions have practical limitations too. So, yeah, and like one idea I'm sort of interested in, like, is um, the BM25 vector search hybrid search. Is that more robust now? Because I think of like the sort of symbolic lexical search being more robust, and then. So like on that layer and, and running some experiments to try to, like as I'm still getting the beer data sets in, we've almost finished and then I'll be able to do these kind of experiments. And then also I think with the ranking layer, like um, maybe you can have like, you, you use the same rank fusion you use in hybrid search to have some kind of symbolic like clicks or something like that where you, where you have a sort as well as the you know neural re-ranking and then you rank fuse those to maybe improve the robustness on sort of those two layers. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah. So I sh again, uh, I perhaps I should have mentioned that that some sort of ensembling usually improves robustness too, and that's your classic result that ensemble can produce both variance and bias, uh, in particular variance. So some ensembling, in particular, like diverse approaches using diverse approaches can work well. Uh, although the information, that's again, the example shows how unique the information in trivial domain is. So look, we are like, it's 2023, neural network revolution after ImageNet, it's a decade. In information trivial, we still use BM25 <laughs> because we, we have hybrid systems that we still need BM25. Okay, so that's difficult. Uh, definitely tells about the, um, the difficulty of the retrieval domain and so one problem, um, uh, like providing a kind of more specific answer to your question. So fusion is definitely one way to go. Uh, then um, there is a problem with fusion, though. The you, you get BM25 and get results from BM25, you get results from a cross encoder or bioencoder, 
and you get scores, of course, and they, their scores are not comparable. So how do you fuse them? That's yeah. So like you can do that round robin, right? Then, um, but the problem with round robin is that if you have systems that are very different in terms of the effectiveness, you may end up like injecting very bad BM25 results into very good uh, and the other way around. Um, yeah, uh, but the, 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 there are also other solutions. Uh, probably we can come up with the models that are somewhat more robust. In particular, cross encoders are more robust than bi encoders. So you can, to some degree, if you rank with a cross encoder, that's actually one advantage that I could have uh, recalled when you asked me why I use cross encoders. Uh, cross encoders are somehow more robust. Like, um, uh, yeah, so this, that's what Takura and, and, and and co-authors uh, found the beer paper. That's actually great. And maybe there are other models that are using maybe lexical clues and other signals kind of combine it together, maybe more robust than just vanilla cross encoders too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to pick your brain a little more on the um, on the rank fusion part because I've had so many conversations about this score based fusion versus rank based fusion that I'd really love to get your take on this as well. Um, so yeah, so if you so like if alpha alpha is the parameter that determines how you combine the rank lists of BM twenty five and vector search, and then like zero point five means equal contribution. Uh, so so with tuning the alpha parameter, if we tune the alpha parameter, like say on beer, like we're going here, it is from zero to one, you know, point one, point two, like is, is that bad machine learning? Cause you know, you're kind of, you're kind of tuning a hyperparameter on the test set. It, maybe could you start with your th thoughts on that idea? Oh, it's a little bit change of topic. So that's, that's maybe, uh, uh, I, I want to make like, um, Oops, sorry. I want to maybe set the stage for this because mm -hmm. I think we jumped to, uh, quickly. So as, as we talked before about mm -hmm. different systems, let's consider two, just two producing different kind of scores that are incomparable, BM25 and say cross encoder. And one, one approach to combine those, just do like round robin, uh, like for one, like basically mix them in the order of, uh, arriving. Mm -hmm. But another approach is to compute a linear combination of these scores. Mm -hmm. And it can be uh, potentially better, uh, but there are two issues. One issue is that you may lose some of the BM25 results that are good because they will be pushed down. The total score is not going to be. But maybe it's not such a big problem. But uh, another problem is that you need to have that alpha coefficient, uh, that fusion. And how do we choose it? Well, ideally, we, we choose that coefficient on the um, training set. Mm -hmm. But we have a beer data set, which is does not does not have a proper development set. Mm -hmm. And people want to, uh, want to claim, say, uh, high scores on beer because that attracts Mm. Like basically as an advertisement of the system and their approaches. So if you are like, I am going to be very straightforward. If you just fine tune alpha on that full beer data set, um, it's, it's going to be an upper bound for your system mm -hmm. performance, but you can't claim that it is achievable. Mm -hmm. Like it may or may not be because you may just overfit. It's not a, such a huge data set, right? It may be, maybe you're just overfitting. You, 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 for example, uh, you, at some point, you decide to double the number of entries in the beer collection in each data set. Imagine like we somehow find more track COVID documents mm -hmm. and queries and expand it and it will stop working. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a good way to say that this is generalized. What I think would be fair to do is to do some sort of cross validation. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, divide each test set into five, compute that alpha on that, and then test on the, the remaining parts. And then it would uh, would tell you like, oh, like this is going to be more um, robust, more mm -hmm. fair estimate of how you can perform on the data set in a few short settings, say, or something like that. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, I also had that, like, let's see what the upper bound would be on a conditional alpha where for each uh, query, we <laughs> go through the whole list and then see which one performed best. And then, like, as a quick, like, kind of hand wavy thing, like on the NF corpus, I was seeing hits at one go from like 1400 to 1800 out of 3200. Doing that just as like a quick sense of what you can get from that. 
But I, that other idea of like you've trained some model or, 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 or a linear combination or some optimization of the BM25 score and the vector search score or the cross encoder score. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, but then you, you the scores could shift. I guess you normalize them with like, it's like the max BM25 score over the minimum BM25 score, you know, do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting because like if you had like a like a query classifier that like takes this query and classifies how to weight the BM25 and the neural, like how to weight the lexical neural methods. I find that whole thing to be very interesting, even though I don't. Uh, yeah, it's it's because I, I, I usually think of the cross encoder as like a stage one, stage two thing where whatever the cross encoder says is the output is the final ranked list where, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting, this kind of hybrid search thing. And I, I think all of these, yeah, it's such an interesting topic. Um, so anyways, uh, I think it's a great coverage of topics. So Leo, do you have anything else you want to maybe add? I just want to quickly follow up on your, um, <laughs> on your, uh, or the problem that you described, mm -hmm. because that's something is indeed is a problem with fusing this course. Yeah, we can compute the linear combination of these scores, but are they like these scores actually properly normalized? There is a potentially huge variability across queries, we just don't know. And in 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 possibly we don't want to use the the linear model. You want to use something like GBRT, right? Boosted mm. regression trees. And in fact, that's uh one way to go. You need a lot of data for this. Uh, that said, in practice for like small domains like MS Marco, I played a lot of this when I, especially like uh, when I was active on that leaderboard in the early stages when I was, um, and, I, and I trained a really strong, uh, purely like classic IR model for this. And I play for the MS Marco document leaderboard. And I played a lot with like fusing different scores from different components. Mm -hmm. and, and I had two options to use one is linear fusion. And another using this nonlinear GBOT mm. model, and uh, and I only in one case I was able to get uh, somewhat um, noticeable performance boost on top of the linear model. So yeah, so linear works well, um, although with the caveat that that's within a single domain, and once you go mm. out of domain, you're not only this coefficient maybe may coefficient may be become like non invalid not appropriate and your your scores may change like your normalization coefficients may need to change for another domain it's it's really um i i think robustness is going to be like really huge topic mm -hmm. for the coming years yes more data and more uh, more everything will help mm -hmm. but it also comes with the efficiency cost and eventually you would want to run these models maybe only even on your phone yeah so it's uh it would have to be super efficient to, yeah. It, it, yeah, it inspires a lot of thought on, like if you have this, yeah, it's like a very tuned system for this domain of data, because uh, you not only have the embeddings that come from maybe a particular domain, like if that's, the, if you fine tune your embedding model on your domain, and then you have the rank fusion is a fine tuned parameter for your data, the cross encoder maybe also is fine tuned for your data, and then that domain shift maybe like domain do, like a distribution shift detection I, i'm not like super caught up with those methods but maybe that kind of thing could help uh like you know like maybe the idea of you, you in the vector space you cluster it and like hdb scan can like do a good job of telling you like this is an outlier point in your vector space kind of you know that kind of thinking uh <laughs> yeah just oh yeah um uh that's that's again the good the good the good reminder that uh, the there is also the difference between more like kind of academic style of um machine learning where you just compute an average score and be done and the data scientists who work more like on real problem they care much more about outliers they care much more about the what sort of the what's in the data and what's like specific results for the specific they dive much deeper and they care about like the the whole spectrum yeah but anyways so i i, I think it's a difficult problem uh i'm i i i can't i don't have a I'm, unfortunately i have to admit that my Crystal ball is not good enough. I made a lot of mistakes about what things are going to be in the future. So that's why I don't want to even make any like predictions. Maybe the, the scale will do a good job for us, although we will have to be efficient, uh, uh, although it may not do 
much more beyond what we um, we see already. But it's hard to predict because it, all those things, there is no theory. It's just like your intuition. It can be wrong. Mine was wrong many times. So I don't want to make this prediction about things that are not uh, clear. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that it's become it's not even like it's become very clear that the the deep learning the the language modeling the generative models it's there is no slowdown there is no like winter per se some may be cooling down in terms of like i don't know finances some layoffs now mm -hmm. but it's not like a real winter some a little chill but that's a huge topic it's probably the area to be in the only thing that i don't want to be a really narrow IR researcher. I think it's probably um, worth trying to be kind of more generic and keep an eye on several sub problems, several subdomains. Mm -hmm. So that's that's probably um, what I I could recommend personally as as a researcher and engineer. Yeah, I think that's really great advice as well. I, get, I think it can be kind of uh, overwhelming trying to keep a tab on like all the <laughs> all the little subtopics. Oh yeah, uh, somebody uh, somebody used like is, is coined like really 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 great uh, term for this. It's uh, it's breakthrough fatigue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing yeah. less than breakthrough <laughs> fatigue. So in the old days, like IBM, where they <laughs> chess playing machine ibm with the you know beating human champions in jeopardy and that happened with like you know five to ten years <laughs> gap and now like we beat humans in go we beat humans in this and then <laughs> like our qa systems are super human kind of and the chat gpt is doing so much stuff oh it can't do math yet but I don't know, maybe like tomorrow it will be able to do math too. So, and how soon will it happen? You never know. And those things that tend not only just like great papers, but all those uh, superhuman uh, claims of superhuman performance, the density in time is just like really, uh, it, yeah, you can get a fatigue from, from just following all that stuff, let alone working on, on, on any problems and trying to improve things. Yeah, yeah, but awesome. it's an interesting time, definitely interesting time to be in AI and deep learning. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I, I feel the excitement of like I th the breakthrough fatigue is very interesting because I also like was like with the stable diffusion thing. I don't know what it was about me, but I kind of just like was like, all right, I, yeah, it's cool. But <laughs> but this new chat GPT thing to me, this breakthrough is like. I love it. It's so fun. Like it's so much fun to play with it. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely nothing like we saw before. Uh, it's uh, it's absolutely amazing in many ways. Yeah, awesome. Well, Leo, thank you so much for joining the WeVA podcast. I think this was such a collection of information and a tour from the you know the cross encoders, the re ranking, the fusion, the uh, you know the non metric spaces in pairs light, of course. And I, I'm so excited to play around with in pairs light. I think that generating data for the custom training of people's particular models, uh, even just benchmarking on these data sets and facilitating with that. I think that idea is just massive. So thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I really enjoyed our conversation.